This program is brought to you by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries. Coming up next on Changing Your World. The grace is standing right there at the door of resistance. The favor is standing right there at the door of resistance. God is like, please, please, please let me come. Please, please, please let me enter in. Nope, nope, don't want to do it your way. Don't even really believe in the moment. And so now, how do we deal with this whole issue of, and whatever it is in your life that you've settled in on? Is there sin that you've settled in on? Something that you just say, well, okay, I know this is wrong, but God loves me. And then you kept doing it. I hope I'm making that clear. Uh, this is wrong, but God loves me. You know, it, 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 there's something, what, what's wrong with that, Pastor? I mean, isn't that the truth? Uh, I'll let you decide. Let's begin in Titus. Let's begin in Titus chapter 2. Now, here's where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you the info. In fact, let's start at Philippians chapter 2, Philippians 2, 13 in the NLT. Let's start there, and I'm going to give you the information, and then you, you make the decision now. You make the decision. We exalt in grace. We exalt in grace, but I cannot have, I cannot have the people of God deceived. It's a real thin line here, but we can get it. Now, watch this. For God is working in you. Now, for the Christian, every person that's born again, God's working in you. What is he doing? What is God doing on the inside of you? He's given you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Whoa. So God's working in you, and what is he doing? He's working on changing your desire. You can't change your behavior with the same desire. And you've tried to change your desires in the past, but you've not been successful. They keep going back. So he says the Holy Spirit was sent to work in you to change your desire and to give you the ability to do what pleases him. See, as Christians, we love God. Man, we want to please God. And sometimes we fall short. But the Holy Spirit is going to keep working with you until you eventually arrive to a point where your desire has changed and you can please him. Now, this is, this is not something that may happen overnight, not to say that the Holy Ghost can't do that. There are some Christians he's taken overnight and just snatched the desire away from them. He can. But for you, to, you know, I, won't, I don't want you to give up. The Holy Spirit's working in you. And sometimes when you miss the mark, just remind yourself, the Holy Spirit's working in me. And the desire, what is he working on? Changing your desires. Sometimes what he'll do is take what you're doing and turn it against you where you don't want it no more. <laughs> you know, it's like a guy who had a desire to do, co do cocaine until he almost died. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he's like, I want to do it, but I almost died the last time. The, he knows how to change your desires. you got to trust that the Holy Spirit's working to you to change your desire. The Holy Spirit's working to you to change your desire. And he's going to give you the power to do what pleases him him. Now, what's the problem? The problem is the Holy Spirit can work and change your desire, but you're not really interested in doing what pleases him. You're interested in doing what pleases you. And so if you're interested in doing what pleases you, even though the Holy Spirit's working to change your desire and you sense that he's changing your desire, 
Your memory keeps saying, I, I know I enjoyed this, so I'm going to do it again. So then you go do it again, and you don't even get a high no more. You're like, well, I don't even know what's going on. He's really working. God is not going to let you divorce him. He is not going to ever quit on you. He's really working on you. But so what's, what's hindering the work of the Holy Spirit? It is your desire. He's trying to give you his desire, but you don't want his desire. He's trying to get you to do what pleases him, but you want to do what pleases you. And that's why I call this section, you know, living to please God or living to please self, because ultimately what you do and how you, belate, how you behave is going to be based on, am I trying to please me or am I trying to please God? But somebody says, well, you know, I don't want to please God. And that's why the Holy Spirit is working on, desire, on your desire to want to please God. But I've met people who the Holy Spirit has changed their desire and they still say, I'm not interested because they allow the world to be their measure of life and not allow the Word of God to be their measure for life. You'll let the world and the norms and the values of the world govern you rather than the Word and the Spirit of God to govern you. So here's what we do know. We know the Holy Spirit has been given to you and He's working. He is working. He's working right now to change your desire. Now, if you could have changed your desire by yourself, and people have tried to do it, well, I'm going to fast for 20 days. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make myself do this for 30 days. Well, I'm going I'm to I'm 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 force myself to do it. And you may be successful for about six months, and then all of a sudden it took one hour, bam, you went back again because it's a work of the Holy Spirit to change your desire. You are a free moral agent, which means you can decide to do whatever you want to do. That's the most powerful thing about a human. You have choice. The most powerful thing about a human is you can do whatever you want to do. That is the right that God has given to every human being, the right to decide. Every, I don't care what government says or anything, you all, you all have been given the basic human right to be a free moral agent and to decide. He says, I give unto you life or death, blessings or cursings. He says, it's going to be up to you to choose. I can't choose for you. And he says, if, if, if you're too dumb to know what to choose, <laughs> he says, let me give you a hint, choose life but he knows that he cannot battle your choice. So what choices are you making? He can't battle your choice. And maybe somebody's not deliberate because they choose to not be delivered. It's not that the Holy Ghost ain't working or what he did. That you just, you made a choice. I, I, I choose to not be delivered. I don't want to change. I like who I am. I am serving self. Okay, so now we know, what, what's, what's, we know what's going on by the Holy Spirit. We know what should be working on the inside of you. All right, let's look at Titus now. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 and 12. Now, I, I know, I mean, don't turn that stream off, man. This is, this is going to help you because, whoo, the world's messy. People are. People don't know what's going on. People, people are hurting and they don't know it's because of what their choices are. They're fighting God. Look at this. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So because of his grace, it's appeared to all men. So now what is the grace of God doing? Teaching us. Look at what the grace of God is doing. The spirit of grace, I refer to him. The grace of God is teaching us that denying ungodliness you know what to deny something means? It means to refuse it. Notice, the grace of God is not saying, oh, I give you a license to do this. The grace of God wants to teach you to refuse it. You got to refuse it. You just can't say, well, this is, just, this is just who I am and this is just what I do. God still loves me. And you didn't even deny it. You didn't even refuse it. You just settled in on it. Teaching us that denying ungodliness, he says denying worldly lust, he says refuse it. He says you're living in a world full of ungodliness and full of worldly lust. Here's what the grace of God will teach you. Refuse it. Deny it. He says, and he says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, he says here's how we should live. We should live soberly. So that means everybody else is, is intoxicated. And, every, and, and people in the world today, they are intoxicated. Their minds. He says, live soberly, live righteously, live godly in this present world where you will find ungodliness and worldly lust. Here's what grace does. 
when you say, I'm under the grace of God, if you're under the grace of God, guess what? You should be demonstrating some refusing and denying of worldly lust and, and ungodliness. But that's not what I see. In people who are, have come to church, who have gotten born again, who even serve sometime at church, but in their private life, they've become comfortable with their ungodliness and comfortable with their worldly lust to the point where they're no longer refusing it. They're accepting it while they put up a phony appearance so the people at church may not necessarily see it. It's easy to see, but people think they cover stuff up. It's kind of like you just smoked before you came into church and you sprayed your mouth with some mouth. You can smell that stuff. You, just, you, 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 you can tell. And so, so what, the point I want to bring up is, are you refusing it? Uh, lasciviousness means no restraint. I have no restraint. I'm, I, I'm trying to find a break. I'm trying to stop. See, there you're trying to do it. You're stuck in lasciviousness, and he gave you the Holy Spirit to help you find the breaks. But how can he help you when you decide it, this is how I am, this is what I want to do, I think this is right because everybody on social media says it's right, I think it's okay because in our society and with our generation, this is what we feel is okay, and so why deny it? And the world even teaches people, don't deny it. Dumb therapists tell you, don't deny any of it, just go for it, just let it all hang out. I used the illustration one time, if you get on a horse without a bit and just tell that horse to go for it, he'll kill you. There's got to be a bit in his mouth uh, and reins where you can control where that horse is going. And that's what the Holy Spirit's trying to do. He's trying to put a bit of God's Word in our mouth so he can help us not just run wild. But if, if we could not deny it, and if you, even, if you, even if you try to deny it and fail and got back up and say, well, let me keep trying, that's... that's You'll get grace that way. You'll get more grace to help that way versus I'm done. This is just what I do. This is just who I am. I decide there's nothing wrong with it. God still loves me and I know it. So I'm not going to be judged. That's another one. I'm not going to be judged by nobody. God don't judge me. So I'm fine. You're, 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 you kind of got it wrong. And there are going to be consequences of character that shows up in your life. And you're going to find out that certain things are not working for you because you can't go any farther than your character. You try to pretend that you're not jealous. You try to pretend that you're not offended. You try to pretend all those things and cover it up with, with fancy speech, but your character is going to limit you. The blessings of God are, are, are pressing in, trying to get in on your life. It's trying to burst the door down. I mean, the hinges are coming off trying to get in your life. And you wake up every day wondering, why is it not happening for me? Because you, can you cannot go any farther than your character. And there's a character crisis in our land. There's a character crisis in the world. And people do not understand that what the enemy is trying to do is to, to, to get you to settle in on, on character that doesn't line up with God's word. And now you're stuck. You're stuck. Wow. I can feel it's quiet in your house, but keep listening. Keep listening. All right, now watch this now. So he goes to verse, uh, so teaching us that denying ungodliness. Let's look at, uh, look at this in the NLT real quick. Uh, sec, uh, Titus 2, 11 and 12 in the NLT. Oh, man, I'm, I'm here to magnify grace. Grace is the answer for sin, not the license for sin. Look at verse 11, 11 and 12. He says, for the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. Verse 12. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should, live in, we, we should live in this evil world with wisdom. We should live in this evil world with righteousness. We should live in this evil world with devotion to God. While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. So it's pretty clear there in Titus. I don't know how you can talk yourself out of that in Titus. Now, am I saying that you should be flawless? You wouldn't need grace if you could. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to make mistakes and you're going to fall, but I'm saying don't settle into it. And if you fail, don't just stay there. Get up, and then there'll be more and more grace. Get up, there'll be more and more grace. If a two-year-old is trying to walk and they fall one time, should you just give up on encouraging them to walk? 
You don't do that as a parent. You, hey, get up, let's keep walking, keep walking. And one day they're walking with no sweat. That's, every, that's how it's going to happen in our life. One day we're living and, and refusing ungodliness with no sweat. And so it may have to be like a two-year-old learns how to walk, but there's grace for you to, to help you with that. Look at uh, James chapter um, 4 and 7. This, this, was a, this was a revelation to me. James chapter 4 and 7. Praise God. Now, uh, to resist means to withstand and to fight against. It's actively fighting against it. Uh, and so he says, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Somebody says, okay, I got born again. And, and, I, and I thank God you got born again, but, you know, submitting yourself to God is also, you know, submitting yourself to what God tells you to do. Uh, it's, it's submission. It's getting under God's mission, okay? And submit yourself to God, therefore to God. And then he says this, and why, why you, when you made the decision to live a life as a Christian, you made the decision to live according to his word, he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay, now that's a promise. And God knows this. If you would just refuse and resist, he'll go. But there are Christians in this world that the last thing they think about is refusing and resisting. The temptation comes, they go, oh, no, here you go, I'm an oak. You know, <laughs> and you don't understand that, that there's something that happens when you actively stand up withstand and fight against. And so what happens, resist the devil and he will flee from you. All right, this is interesting because instead of resisting the devil, some Christians are resisting God. Think of that. He said resist the devil. And instead of resisting the devil, you're resisting God. You're resisting what God said in Titus. You're resisting the, uh, the free moral agency of making a decision for life. You're, you're resisting all those things. You're resisting everything that God says. And so if you're resisting everything that God says, then you've got to go back and reexamine your submission position. Am I really submitted if I'm resisting God? Because what happens when you resist God, and he said resist the devil. He's like, you're supposed to be resisting the devil, but you're resisting me. Why are you resisting me? You're supposed to be resisting the devil. Why are you, you know there are people that fight against God. They're fighting God. All God's trying to do is bless them and and, 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 and bring them up and, 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 and do all kinds of great things for them, and they can't see that from where they are, and they're resisting God. Because the world told them, they ain't, ain't, ain't no devils, ain't no demons. They, they say, God don't mind you doing that. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Now, what happens when you resist God instead of resisting the devil? Now, well, first of all, think with me for a moment. Resisting God is a perfect definition of pride. <laughs> That's what it is. Resisting God is a perfect definition of pride. Submitting to God is a great definition of humility. So humility and pride is going to be found within a person's decision to either submit to God or resist God. Now look at the next verse and see what he says. No, go, go to verse 6. Um, Matthew, excuse me, uh, James 4, 6. Back up verse 6. This is interesting. He says, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God, God resists the proud. Oh, wow, wait a minute. He says, resist the devil, but you're resisting God, and now God resists the proud. He said, resist the devil, but you're resisting God, now God resists the proud. Who are the proud? The ones that resist God. <laughs> Whoa, resist the devil, but you're resisting God. And God says, I resist the proud. But he said, I'll give grace unto the humble. The guy that'll submit to God finds grace. The guy that resists God finds nothing. Listen to this. And I really hesitate to say that like it is, but it's like, now I understand it. It's like, God can't do for anybody that won't let him. God can't do for anybody that won't submit to him and agree with him. And what is he going to do for somebody that's resisting him? It, it, the grace is standing right there at the door of, of resistance. The favor is standing right there at the door of resistance. God is like, please, please, please let me come. Please, please, please let me enter in. Nope. Nope. Don't want to do it your way. Don't even really believe in the moment. Wow. And, and that's almost like 
you know, the, 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 the sin of, of unbelief. It's like, it's the only thing that wasn't taken care of on the cross. Every sin was taken care of except for the sin of unbelief. And wouldn't this be a form of unbelief? So what can he do for the person that doesn't believe? What does he do for the person who decides, I'm going to resist God? Ain't nothing wrong with this. I don't believe that. I don't believe it. God is love. See, we, 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 don't, we don't know how to deal with that phrase, God is love. We, we, we translate God is love as God is compromise. Now, God is love, and God loves those who still compromise, but he's limited in what he can do because it requires cooperation. You are a free moral agent. You have to decide, I'm going to let God bless me. People are going to live all their lives coming to church and saying God loves them and never benefit from what God could do while you were on the planet. I'm talking about what God could do while you're on the planet. I'm going to have to let you decide what happens when you, when you die because, I mean, the Bible's real clear. He says, all you got to do to get to heaven is believe. And then I question, what is belief? Is belief somebody that says it? Well, I believe, and then does contrary. Is it enough to say, I believe? Well, the Bible says, believe in your heart and say it with your mouth, but that's the case. What's in your heart when you said it? <laughs> There's a lot of different issues you think about when you talk about authentic belief, and when you talk about authentic belief, it eventually it ends up with, are you resting in what he said as submission? It just keeps going, it keeps going. There's this thing that the world is trying to get you to do some stuff, I'm going to show you what it's, what it's called in Scripture, and it's going to really be a mind-boggling thing for you to see what's really going on. In fact, I'll show it to you right now. Go to Jude, the book of Jude, verse 4. I want to read it in the NIV and the NLT, the book of Jude, verses 4, because this is what I believe is happening. Jude 4, let's keep it there in the King James, and then go to the NIV, and then go to the, the New Living Translation. Let's read this. For therefore... For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning, turning the grace of God uh, into lasciviousness. Now, that word turn means uh, transpose, or what it says is they want to take lasciviousness and put it in the place of grace. And they want to take grace and put it in the place of lasciviousness and then they want to deny or refuse the only Lord God. When I first saw that, I'm like, oh, whoa, what is this scripture saying? New Living Translation. He says, I say this because some, some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. They said that God's marvelous grace has allowed us to live immoral lives. You know, that's true today. I see a lot of people in church that says God's grace allows me to live an immoral life. That's not the truth. God's grace doesn't allow you to live an immoral life. God's grace is the answer for not having to live an immoral life. He says the condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So he connects the person who says that grace is my license to live immoral as someone who denies God. <laughs> he is saying when you made a decision to say that I'm under grace, which allows me to live an immoral life. I, I remember there were preachers going around saying, you know, well, I got a divorce, but the grace of God allows me to do that. Or, hey, it's okay to go ahead and have sex with these people, but the grace of God allows me to do that. You just got to know somewhere on the inside, do you know that ain't right? So think about what it has to, what has to happen on the inside of a person to reach that point. <laughs>